see many members of the pinball media here ready to record this all the historic information that we're going to cover today um, we've we've talked uh, before with Roger Sharp and with a focused conversation we got uh, a lot of valuable historic information and it did come to my attention somewhere in the past few years that uh, there was a scenario that Roger Sharp was involved in for the Williams pinball business, or we will explore exactly what that means, but some, some kind of business entity to be taken out of Williams intact. Now, for the history of what actually happened, you have the documentary film by Greg Maletic, Tilt the Battle to Save Pinball. And then uh, there's coverage in RGP and Pinside of what happened with uh, Gene Cunningham and Wayne Gilliard from Australia trying to take parts of the business but not the whole thing and how they stumbled along. But we're going to look at another version of history where the business stayed intact. Uh, Roger, can you give us the general overview of what your plan was? Sure, let me first say how, uh, how disappointed I am that I'm not there in person. Um, I'm hoping maybe at some point in time in the future, if uh, Dave and Gabe and the rest of the folks uh, would like to have me back, uh, I would love to be back. Uh, but uh, travel arrangements just fell apart. Uh, so, uh, so again, uh, very disappointed, but uh, many thanks to James and the rest of the folks uh, who I guess have pulled together uh, this uh, ability to do a Zoom. Uh, the, the, the one point I want to make before really directly answering Dave's question is uh, how remarkable it is that Dave has come up with this as a subject. It's really by surprise, but leave it to him to really find something that's unique and different, believe. Uh, because nobody's ever asked me the specifics you know, as, as Dave has. And in all honesty, over the past, what, 23 years? Yeah. It's as if I had ever contemplated or thought about what would have happened uh, had I been successful in my uh, ability to uh, to purchase uh, Williams. Alley. So uh, hats off to Dave for uh, letting me scratch my head and uh, think back to uh, some of the basics. But uh, I guess the best way to approach it and start, um, and Dave, feel free if I'm missing anything. Oh, or, I'll, I'll have a whole bunch of questions, but I, I'm, I'm you go sure. for the overview and then we'll dive in. Well, uh, the overview very simply was a couple of years earlier, people were not aware of it, and I know I've talked about it. I had uh, reached out to... Uh, some folks in the uh, financial community and had a proposal together to purchase uh, Premier technology. Uh, everything was moving forward. Uh, we got all the books and uh, looked at them and there were some things that just did not add up. Uh, so that kind of got, I'll, I'll, it's a cliche phrase, it kind of got the ball rolling uh, in regard to that uh, ill-fated attempt and then lo and behold uh, you know a couple of years later uh, WMS decided uh, to close down pinball and uh, I reached back to the same financial people uh, still thought it was viable to enter into the marketplace this time with a much better established uh, well entrenched company as compared to uh, what the situation had been uh, with Premier and uh, put together a uh, at least a preliminary financial proposal, reached out to Scott uh, Schweinfurth, Schweinworth, Schweinfurth, I think, the, uh, the CFO, to ask for uh, what's the sale price? What are you selling? Um, because I had heard some rumors that uh, there were some other folks 
that we're uh, interested in and uh, considering. I, I actually being Gary Stern, I think had expressed some interest to, to maybe come in and pick up uh, some of the assets uh, that did exist. And uh, unfortunately, Scott uh, never uh, really responded favorably. He said there was no interest in uh, selling uh, that part of the company at all. When I found out subsequently, uh, after a couple of other attempts, was that the, uh, and again, this is from memory and from what I had been told, so let me just preface everything as to whether or not what I am expressing to you is actually uh, the, the real and true story. But what was relayed to me was that the company saw a greater value in bankrupting and shutting down PIM than it did in selling it. They could do better as a tax write-off to do so. And understand a few years earlier, the company had split out electronics from Midway uh, as two separate uh, stock entities. So, uh, so again, we were kind of left without an opportunity to do anything until subsequently, I think it was about a year and a half, two years later, um, the decision was made, determination was made, and I think because of some uh, legal pressure and some other folks who stepped in saying that they were wrong in their assumption, and by then it was already too late to do anything when uh, Gene and Wayne stepped in uh, and uh, put okay. in their offers and ultimately uh, purchased uh, whatever assets uh, that they were allowed to purchase. So that's like the top line about all yeah. of it. Uh, let me, uh, since David Fix is in the room, I'm going to ask him a simple yes or no question. Uh, David Fix, were you aware of, other than Gary Stern, there was another corporation that would have wanted to buy the pinball division at, if the price were right? Yeah, by yes, the, yes, okay, he says yes. Um, okay, who was that? Was it a company or was it an individual or a group? Do you feel like you could disclose that? Or if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it's 23 it, it, years, so. It, it was Ralph Coppola. Ralph ICE. Coppola of ICE in Buffalo, New York. Oh, that's right, you know, thank okay. you, David and Dave. Uh, okay. I had, I had remembered that uh, Ralph had expressed interest in pinball. He wants right. to elaborate. Let's hear what one, else. One more thing I want to point out that Ralph did fly in to buy the Williams asset, but he also bought, flew in, and talked with Gary Stern about buying Sega before Gary got on board. Okay, and, so uh, another alternate history. Yeah, where it, was, it was two companies. He was going to do the double company and go in totally into that. Oh, wow. Okay. So possible future seminar once... Once enough of the uh, guilty parties have died off that we can <laughs> talk about them without uh, conflicting stories. But, and, and also uh, later this afternoon when Jim Patla comes in, I think we might explore uh, yet some other ramifications. Uh, so let's get back to one, one timing question here. So you're saying that the... Uh, particularly the Wayne Gilliard deal, because he had some rights to manufacture. Uh, that was 2001-ish? Yes. Okay. If I remember correctly. He and had the ability to manufacture Bally pinball machines as a name only. Right. So he had that Bally brand name. or Right. With an approval by Bally of each and every game, I guess, the same as they do. Uh Correct. Yeah. If I were a finance guy looking to back something like this and knowing what I do about the game industry, the first question I would ask you is, who's your sales manager? Because I want to know how you're planning to get revenue for this venture. And did you have someone lined up to be the sales manager? Well, uh, look. Obviously, Joe Dillon was still around on staff. Oh, yeah. Looking at uh, this alternate history, it, it gives me pause to think back to Philip K. Dick, uh, science fiction writer who uh, created uh, an alternate universe with the man in the high castle. So I kind of think about this 
in the same context. Uh, look, as a blanket overview, uh, and we can get into the specifics, uh, I would have uh, hoped to keep the entire staff uh, intact. Uh, all the salespeople, whether it's Leslie Ross and Bob Lentz, uh, I believe, and maybe Dave uh, Fix remembers differently, I believe that Steve Blatzbieler was still alive. I believe that Joe Dillon was still alive. They had not passed away. Uh, if, if neither or either were gone, uh, I truthfully would have reached uh, into the uh, coin operated amusement game industry, uh, veterans. Uh, mm, I probably yeah. would have reached uh, first to Kenny Anderson. Right. I was just going to bring up that name. Ken well, I Anderson. worked with a game plan, and I knew that Ken from Chicago Coin. Uh, he recently passed away last year, but at the uh, great age of 85. So uh, I, I think that 20 some odd years ago, he was still somewhat fit and vigored and whatever. Uh, I would have kept uh, Marty Glazman, uh, who ultimately moved on. So to, to answer your question, I, I really looked at it from the standpoint of wanting to keep everything intact. That included the building and the assets. Uh, for those who don't remember, 3401 North California Avenue. Uh, the company had purchased uh, an area on the uh, south side of Roscoe. Roscoe was a crossing street along with California Avenue, where Georgia Nuts used to be and across the street had been uh, Diane's Tomain Palace, as we affectionately called it, which uh, switched over to being a, uh, a hot dog place uh, with gourmet hot dogs. But the company had purchased that entire block and had opened it up, renovated it for all of uh, video game uh, development. Behind the main building, the factory, was a smaller building, which is where WMS Gaming first started. Uh, the plan in place Ken Fidesna had acted as the, I guess, the overall architect and planner for the uh, facility up in Gurney, which became uh, the factory to manufacture slot machines. But the plan ultimately was uh, in place with the purchase of the back lot, which became what we, some of us, called the glass tower, uh, which is where everything relocated. So the plan would have been and I'll share with you, it was a seven and a half million dollar opening bid to purchase everything. Uh, would have been for the building, would have been, again, uh, to keep everybody intact and uh, go from there. Hmm. Um, okay, I guess first I want to mention Joe Dillon. Uh, when I was operating, he was uh, my sales guy at Seabird North Atlantic Distributing in Randolph, Massachusetts. So I know him way back. Um, now he does have a little memorial embedded in uh, Star Wars Episode One, I guess, in in the attract mode. RFM. Yes. Oh, RFM. Okay. So so he died uh, in 1999, I guess. Uh, right. It would have been around the same time. So obviously, thank you for. Uh, getting me to remember back timeline wise. So Marty. Uh, I believe I would have uh, stepped up and had him been uh, the number one. Mark Strews had come in at the time. Uh, Mark eventually wound up working with Eugene Jarvis. And Andy Eloff at Raw Thrills had up their sales. Um, as I said before, Ken Anderson, uh, mm -hmm. probably someone uh, such as Paul Jacobs and others I would have looked at again. I've been around the industry, admittedly, going back a prior 25 years or so. It wasn't as if there weren't a number of people that I had not worked with or been a part of uh, back then. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, they would have supported my efforts and uh, filled in any of the holes for salespeople. I just remembered Mark Chan was West Coast. Uh, so we, we, we had a, a fairly healthy a group of salespeople, uh, Rachel Davies. 
Oh yeah, I remember her. You have multiple games on location. It is a good idea to have a spare play field back at the shop. You can easily show these uh, names are just coming back to me. Uh, but uh, I think we had about five or six people on board uh, that uh, were, were overseeing uh, pinball and video, obviously. So I would have looked at those people as well as some of the key people at the distributor level to see if they would want to step up. Because my plan was a fairly extensive plan as I laid it out with, and I'll share it, it was Banco Parabias, P-A-R-I-B-A-S. Basically, uh, they were a company that backed motion pictures, Patriot uh, Films and others. Uh, I knew some of the uh, key executives there who were on board to, uh, I guess, uh, support whatever my dream was going forward. In 1999 Pinball Expo, our factory tour was the Gurney factory. And they were making the pinballs up there. Yes. Uh, so it seems like there would have been some transition time. Uh, and I'm a little curious about uh, would you be raiding the WMS, uh, the company that was living on for gaming, would you be raiding some of their factory people to do, for the production? or Not necessarily. I think much of that was established because of the technology with the monitors and all for Pinball 2000. Uh, you know, we, we still had an active factory <clears throat> somewhat for uh, 3401. So I would have looked at those folks. Um, God, I think Russell Landsberger comes to mind um, and others uh, who were overseeing uh, production materials. Uh, Jim Weinrock. Um, again, I, I would have gone back to the core people who had the experience, familiarity uh, with uh, all that had transpired the years prior and would have looked at them to either staff, you know, admittedly, there were a number of folks that we wound up losing on the manufacturing side who were local to 3401 North California Avenue and not local to Gurney. Mm. Uh, they weren't able to commute. So we wound up losing a lot of people. Uh, if one remembers, I don't think it was around the time of uh, any of the expos, uh, there were a couple of large inflatable rats that had been uh, put on display outside the building <laughs> at first times uh, who were striking and asking for uh, better wages, conditions. Better pest control. I'm sorry? Better pest control. Yeah, well, that too. But I'm just saying, you know, it wasn't as if we had uh, a workforce that was totally dedicated to the company, although uh, admittedly, the tenure of people, uh, the multiple generations working in manufacturing was remarkable. I think that the average uh, was uh, of employment was over 20 years. And no, that a... is something that you really don't find uh, in most manufacturing uh, companies. Sounding like they might uh, want to stick with it then. Well, um, and I would have wanted them to stick with it. And again, with better conditions uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, everybody was on board. Well, maybe it's time to turn to the fun stuff. Um, first of all, was this company, in your mind, going to uh, get as broad a rights of game types as it could from Williams? Like, for example, would you want, in addition to pinball, to uh, get whatever rights or, or non-compete that Williams WMS would not get into uh, mechanical redemption pieces or some other type of game that you might need to make between pinball runs? No, I mean, I think that, look, uh, on balance, I knew that the company was geared up for uh, slot machines, 
uh, that they weren't really looking at doing anything in quotes mechanically at all, uh, mm -hmm. video as well, and bringing in uh, some of the new people uh, after the acquisition of Atari. Um, so the focus really had been on pinball only. If we had spun out any uh, type of ancillary business, sure, uh, probably novelty redemption would have been something that would have been considered, but uh, the primary focus or the purchase or potential purchase or the offer or the potential offer, unfortunately, uh, that never really came to pass was truly just for the, uh, the pinball business itself. Okay, but but then again, on, on the optimistic side, it sounds like WMS would not have put great value on a oh non-compete no. for mechanical novelty redemption. So they, they say, yeah, no, sure, and in we, fact, we agree Dave, we won't do that. Yeah, and in fact, uh, and I don't remember exactly, and maybe you guys have access to it or, or whatever. Uh, I think that they valued the, the shutting down of the company as a uh, three or four million dollar paper loss uh, yeah. they propped up the stock with so I was coming in uh, admittedly at a much higher valuation just based on what we saw as being the market opportunity and it's funny in retrospect now over two decades later seven million dollars is like a drop in the bucket you know, yeah. where pinball profits are today are, you know, seven million is, is a loss. Back mm -hmm. then, just the, you know, bill of materials and, and the uh, uh, profit margins uh, were much tighter uh, yeah. and lower than they've become. Well, a good benchmark for that was the Medieval Madness remake, which when it was announced, uh, at a pinball expo that that the remake was coming and they took those first orders for the limited edition and in that one weekend uh the gross bookings were uh like 10 million just for that one title from a company that had not proven itself to have manufacturing capabilities yep uh you know the Bay Area amusements, so they they knew their parts, but manufacturing a pinball. Um, now, now we will get to some audience questions a little later on. I I want to uh, build the the general outlines of what this plan would be like, and and we. Well, and I also felt it was important to uh, and and thank you for filling in that gap, Dave. Uh, I wanted to just point out that back then, seven million dollars was seven million dollars. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you know, I don't want anybody thinking, well, there there was no way in hell that anything could have happened because uh, they didn't offer enough. You know, the the uh, the offer, as I mentioned before, for Premier was sitting at about four million, uh, but uh, the losses that Premier had and what the valuation was was probably under a million and a half. Okay, so another instance where they they did not take the uh, better compensation of selling the business and went for the tax loss. Yes. Hmm. Um, well, continuing on this on the fun topic of what the products would be, um, can you tell us roughly when in 1999 uh, you were making that offer? Was it uh, before the Black Monday or after? Uh, it was after. After. I, I got caught by surprise. I know that George Gomez had knew, his talk yeah, we, uh, at Expo. Uh, and then Monday came. Um, to, you know, look, there was a sense of things. Uh, Neil Nicastro's impatience, uh, the volatility of the stock, what was taking place with... Uh, Williams uh, Electronics, specifically home entertainment, uh, and what John Rowe and, and uh, Byron Cook were dealing with out of Corsicana, Texas for the home product. Uh, the fact that we were getting our heads handed to us because we didn't really know how to, how to be successful in what the investment was necessarily to be a uh, 
company creating a consumer product at the retail level. That's a whole other story and has nothing to do with pinball necessarily. Um, so I think that everything was somewhat uh, fractured, if you will, uh, by uh, Neil and the rest of the uh, board of directors, including uh, his father. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis. Louis, who had really, you know, kind of started it all. Uh, but really the focus and the intent was uh, to try to tap into gaming. That was going to be the next great groundswell. That's where they could really kind of uh, blow out product and uh, make a great return on investment, uh, specifically because you have shared revenue in gaming, so you're not limited to a single price that you're getting on the sale of uh, a particular product. Uh, the margins for the home cartridges and what have you uh, were, were good, but not as voluminous as they were with the aspect of where gaming was. So uh, I want to say that when things came about and realized, all right, they're shutting it down. And I, I stayed. I mean, I was with the company uh, for a period of time thereafter, um, full time until the summer of 2000. So I want to say absolutely sometime in the first or the second quarter of 2000 would have been when uh, I would have started my outreach to my financials, financial people to say, here, here's another play. This one's even better, giving them an outline as to the history of the company, how it was positioned, um, what had been taking place in terms of volume of, of uh, product that had been manufactured. And I know I've been off base. My sons have pointed it out in regard to what I have uh, basically stated in the past for the production numbers of episode one, uh, although it kind of aligns, but I'm sure that Jim Patla later on can get into more specifics that are much more, uh, much more focused and definitive than what my comments have been. But, you know, I saw, I saw a, a huge opportunity. I also saw a lot of missed opportunities uh, that uh, unfortunately not only Williams, but the rest of the industry uh, weren't taking advantage of where I thought that there could be uh, a great upsurge. Mm -hmm. So one, one detail that I haven't remembered and I've been trying to, they announced on that Monday, right after the Pinball Expo in 1999, and I know they cut short what they could have sold for episode one, but yep. um, how long did they run through the orders that they were taking? How much longer did production go after that announcement? I think we ran up until the end of the year, mm -hmm. you know, based on whatever the build rate was at that point in time. And admittedly, I think what probably were probably down to maybe, uh, I think we might have been at about 100 games a week or so. Oh. Okay, so that, that's. Uh, so we were way down solid. from where we had been. Yeah, but still, that, from uh, late October to the end of the year, that's still quite a few. Yeah, no, it would have been a couple of thousand games. And I have to believe. Now, in the documentary by Greg Maletic, at a couple points, I, and I forget whether it's in the main film or the, the extras, but somewhere in there, there Jim Patla and uh, someone else uh, at different times mention that the third game, Wizard Blocks, was not going to be ready in time for the end of production of episode one, even if episode one had been allowed to run its course, its normal course of sales. So there was already a, a question there. Um, and you're scrambling to see what you can do to try to purchase the company. What was your thought about uh, getting Wizard Blocks ready? Like, is this a good thing that you were, production was gonna be off for a few months and Wizard Blocks would have time to, get finished or what did you think? Well, I think part of the problem, and maybe this has already been aired and 
revealed by folks, uh, you know, and, and maybe Pat has uh, addressed it as well. Uh, the resources that Pat had were cut back. There was no sense of urgency. Obviously, this was not an overnight decision by Neil and Lou and everyone else. They knew that it was coming. They were timing it around a particular fiscal quarter, end of the year, uh, to prop things up for the stock. Uh, so, you know, Pat did not have the full complement of folks working with him on Wizard Blocks. I remember playing the game, and, and there were great developments and improvements ongoing. And I think that uh, however Greg and his film or, or anybody else might have thought, I truly believe that the game would have been ready in time for uh, AGE in, uh, in London in January in some form. So I don't think that it would have been a matter of uh, months of not having product. Uh, I, I think that it would have been uh, an opportunity to uh, really, or EAG, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, the game show uh, convention in, in the UK. And, and in fact, the, the show which a year earlier had been the first showing of uh, Pinball 2000. Yep, absolutely. So that would have been the plan uh, all along, would have been to do another gala, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, be comparable to what we wound up doing with uh, Revenge from Mars. But uh, I think we would have been in decent shape. And I know that Matt and Tom were working furiously on what was going to be Playboy, specific to Hans Rosenzweig's request for a more adult theme. Hans was at uh, Nova Operati, who was our largest uh, distributor uh, in the world supporting pinball in Germany and elsewhere. So I, I think that we would have been in, in reasonable shape to kind of get us to uh, mid-year of uh, 2000. Hmm. Uh, and, and you would have retained all the development teams that... Okay, so that's the good question, Dave. That's the one that I have pondered mm -hmm. when hit me from the blind side on kind of revisiting history. Uh, my hope would have been that everybody would have wanted to stay. Pure and simple. I don't know if they would have. I know that Steve Ritchie and I know that Steve is going to be a fantastic this weekend. He is, and yes. Press this or, or not, but I know that Steve's heart was in doing video and moved back to California Had come up with California speed and was working on some other projects. I don't know if he still had a desire to do pinball, but I God, I, I would love to have had him uh, stay and work on pinball. Uh, I would have wanted uh, Larry DeMar to stay. Uh, Hat, obviously, uh, Dennis, the, the whole group. Um, and hopefully would have created a work environment that would have allowed them to feel number one, more a part of the business. Talking about profit sharing and some other things that I had rolled out in my plan with the investors. Uh, that included, and I'll go back just to touch upon it, that included all the factory workers to not necessarily have it be an owned company, but Understand that buying into a company that a public that had been publicly traded, uh, suddenly a company and that kind of changes the dynamics of what you can or cannot do uh, legally. Uh, but I would have looked at you know healthcare plans, 401ks, and all the rest of it in a totally different light uh, to to really treat whoever stayed as uh, as family much more so. Uh, something comparable to what Mike Stroll created, uh, you know, 20 years earlier uh, when he became president at uh, Williams and created an environment that really encouraged uh, people to feel as if they were part of something bigger than themselves. So, uh, so yeah, my plan would have been to meet with everybody, 
and say, here, this is what the ground rules are going to be. Uh, yes, I am heading up the company. I, I knew that I was going to be, in quotes, the president, uh, that we were well funded and that I had a vision of uh, where I wanted to go. I mean, I will touch upon the fact that, and, and maybe this is sacrosanct, uh, I don't believe that all of the games going forward needed to be Pinball 2000. That was a question I had, of course. Uh, so, I, so saw my, I saw the opportunity as doing a dual line and not necessarily saying, all right, Pinball 2000 will only be Bally and conventional pinball will be Williams. It probably would have gone a little bit back and forth, but I saw there being a unique opportunity comparable to the arguments that I had with Mike Stroll that directly impacted me personally with the success of Black Knight and the need for Barry Osler, may he rest in peace, to jump in with uh, Jungle Lord and uh, take the place of what was Barracora and pushing Barracora back by two years because Mike believed that everything had to be a double level, which I admittedly did not believe that there was a single solution for pinball. And I still believe that today. I don't think that there is a single solution, although we've gone so far past where things were again over 20 years ago. But uh, yes, my, uh, my idea, if you will, would have been to embrace uh, a couple of different approaches to the continued uh, evolution of pinball back then. Hmm. So you would have, uh, you think, two titles a year? Uh, as a steady pace? God, no, we weren't at two back then. Well, we ultimately were when everything kind of fell apart. Let's face it, Cactus Canyon got uh, shorted. Uh, so did uh, Medieval Madness in terms of production and where the demand was. Uh, no, I mean, I think that, look, my attitude on licensing <clears throat> had always been maybe four a year. Spring, summer, fall, winter. So if that were to be the case, and I would not suggest right now, nor back then, that everything needed to be a license. I didn't believe it then. I have been brought around to understanding and believing it now, much more so just given the dynamics of a marketplace that has significantly changed from where it had been. Uh, but uh, I want to say that there was enough design teams and enough people working where I, I think that easily we could have gone with uh, probably four to six games per year. I think the uh, indisputable fact where other than Harley Davidson, which I pushed on as well as what Larry and Pat did with Adams Family Gold, the company never went back in to do shorter runs, if you will, for uh, any of the pinball titles. Uh, I would have taken an approach that would have been diametrically opposed to that and what has now become the standard for all of the companies in the business, which is I would have gone back to distribution and would have said, look, you know, who's willing to step up? The only reason we did a thousand for Adams Family Gold was when the question was asked, um, that's how many orders uh, people were willing to commit to, not financially, just saying, if you build it, yes, we'll take 50, we'll take 40, we'll take 23. Whatever the numbers were, when all of those were tabulated, it came out to, I think it was like about 996 <laughs> or whatever, and the company decided to build the full thousand and not go any further. I will say, and maybe Pat, Larry, or anybody else remembers it differently, maybe even Jim, I will say that at about two thirds of the way through, there was an opportunity to sell even more uh, but Neil decided, no, screw it. We don't need the extra couple of hundred or whatever the numbers might be. We need to move on from it. So I, I think to, to recognize that the marketplace had absolutely an influence and an impact on the decisions that you make as a manufacturer. And unfortunately, under the leadership that existed, the marketplace was secondary in terms of what the company wanted to do based on financials, financial quarters, and whatever else. 
So um, it wasn't ideal, but again, as a publicly held company, you have certain standards that you have to abide by in terms of the volatility of your stock price. So I don't know if that totally answers the question. Well, but, but you did bring up some, some very interesting angles there. In particular, uh, one of the things you could even tell your backers is you knew about more demand for medieval madness and cactus canyon so there were a couple things fully designed that you could do a rerun on and yep. as a filler you know if you were if needed and maybe even just as an out and out campaign and it, it wasn't very long after that that uh, gary stern having the luxury of operating as the only manufacturer in pinball was able to really cash in on that idea first with their harley davidson and then uh south park and uh you know in throughout the aughts they just got more and more of a sense that hey we can we can capture the upside we can do those reruns if yes if there's more demand um so how do yeah, you I've, 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 I've often uh thought you know look people have said that i'm the man who saved pinball uh, I've actually thought of it in the context of I might have saved pinball, but the one who kept it alive was Gary. So between the two of us, uh, we have a shared place in history. Yeah, and there's uh, proof now, and, and Gary Stern was, was the one who recognized it. And if you look at any of the manufacturers, now that competition is back, it's still the case that uh, American and Chicago Gaming and Stern Pinball and Jersey Jack sell back catalog titles and are willing to do reruns. Yes. And that was that was like an old jinx or at least a perception that oh we can't do a rerun at the time that our competition has a new title because new is so important and that's totally been proven wrong now. So from, well, from 2022. And, and truthfully, yeah. And if, uh, back then, look, the marketplace was totally different. About 95% commercial, 5% uh, home. You could get away with going back in and doing reruns. Uh, a couple of hundred machines here or there or whatever else weren't going to, wasn't going to hurt the apple cart, depending on the markets that you were penetrating and supporting. Uh, you know, you wind up doing what a trilogy of uh, Pinbot, right? And Bride of Pinbot. You wind up doing Cyclone and Hurricane and and, and Comet. Um, you know, all of those. You know, not suggesting that they could have stayed as Cyclones, if you will, uh, or or Pinbot and Jackbot and Bride uh, under one banner, one name. But you know, the concept was there to do so. Yeah. Even and even further back, back. And do some limited uh, some limited numbers, uh, you know. And, and I think that that was the missed opportunity that all the companies felt back then, and and even back in the day when it was the original Stern, you just did not go back in and do anything uh, that was going to be a in quotes a remake, a rehash of something that was older, even if it had you know. Yeah, so you had to do similar games, and a good example, I think, uh, from my operating days, uh, Gottlieb did soccer and super soccer, and then uh, like a year later, it's top score in 300, very similar right. gameplay. Um, all right, so well, let's... Or in the case of Gottlieb, specifically, single player, two player, and four player electromechanicals. Yep. yep. Um, let's talk specifically about that home market then. So if we can project back to 1999, uh, yes, the, there were some outliers uh, and some of them were uh, pretty uh, visible, so to speak, on RGP, rec.games.pinball. I bought a new inbox game, but they were going to the classic uh, operator-centric distributors and going through that that column in the chart of the operator and they're coming in as 
an individual buyer buying for their home trying to convince like a Betson, uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm just buying this, you know, it's, it's money for you. And some people were managing to do that, but it was so rare that they were bragging about it. Uh, but it wasn't too long before that uh, started to become more prominent as a thing, and of course, just growing to where we are now. Uh, but if you can project back to your state of mind at the time of this possible buy of uh, the Williams pinball assets, what did you think uh, you could grow the home market to, like market share percent? One of the first things I did, and it taught me an invaluable lesson, uh, one of the first games I worked on when I started the company in 1988 was Banzai Run. And uh, I remember working out a deal, and now it's been done numerous times, uh, but worked out a deal with Hamacher Schlemmer. Oh, to yeah. Banzai Run in their catalog and the stores. Uh, <clears throat> for, I think, and this, God, it's going to sound so strange. I think for the unheard price of like $7,500, <laughs> you could get a bonsai run. And I remember uh, Ira Bettelman being one of the most vocal distributors that we had out of C.A. Robinson, in California, just coming down on Marty and Joe Dillon. What's Roger doing? You know, oh my God, he's selling games. He's taking market away from us. And it's like, if you guys think that you can sell a bonsai run for 70. I mean, it's double. Wow. It's going to be fine. You're not going to lose any market. I think we wound up selling maybe a half a dozen games. And, and, and I had to come up with some things to justify what I wanted to do, which is so outside the box for the industry. Look, you know, my background wasn't a traditional coin op background, as I think everybody knows. I came in from a totally different world with a totally different mindset and a, and a totally different approach to everything that I touched. And that was from all the marketing that I was doing, uh, whether it was licensing, whether it was public relations, uh, whether it was all of it down the line. And the thing that I realized with Hamacher Schlemmer and one of the problems to answer your question, Dave, because we weren't really set up at that point in time was I needed to know that number one, on the front end, I had a sales network that could work directly at retail, whether it was, and, and understand over 20 some odd years ago, you had any number of brick and mortar uh, stores out there that don't exist anymore. Uh, so it wasn't as if I, I was at a loss of uh, available outlets potentially one of the key ingredients was the cost uh, admittedly there needed to be margins those margins made my 7500 for bonsai run we knew that at retail we needed to be under two thousand dollars and that wasn't possible even what, what the bill of materials were so even if i go into a brookstone or a hamacher schlemmer or others uh, of that ilk uh, the problem is that I'm dealing in a, a, a very finite market. Uh, you know, the old joke was uh, that I used to hear, the only difference between men and boys is the price of their toys. Well, that's great. And for people back then, the expenditure for a pinball machine wasn't viable. For a used game, because most distributors would run ads the fourth quarter of every year around the holidays, trying to get rid of old equipment. Yeah, I mean, you could sell games for a thousand dollars. Yeah, to empty out the bottom so they'd buy more new ones to- buy. Exactly. Yeah. But I think the problem was, uh, I did not give any thought to what now has become Stern's The Pin. I uh, not, did not give any thought at all to what Tiger Electronics did way back when with Roger Schiffman, uh, when they created a uh, home pin. I did work with uh, Harry Williams way back when, when Brunswick was making a big push for a uh, home pinball. Mattel had come up with uh, a game called Las Vegas that never went into full production. There were a number of companies that were looking at opportunities 
following what Bally had done with uh, their home game uh, versions. Uh, so I think that for full-size pinball, I wasn't looking at that as being a primary market. Uh, my focus was on other areas, in all honesty. And more importantly, supporting more activities, more interactivity, more investment on the local operator level. And I say that with, I'll use one example, Diversions was a test location in the north side of Chicago. Uh, Python Angelo, Bill Futzenruder, Barry Osler all appeared for a designer team autograph signing uh, when we introduced Jokers. Uh, I knew the uh, the operator there. In fact, it was the first place where I staged uh, a Papa tournament when I moved back to Chicago. Uh, and uh, it became a way for me to do Thank you, people came, which was nice. Uh, not an overflowing crowd by any stretch of imagination, but I had come up with a questionnaire that I asked if they wouldn't mind just answering some questions and get some feedback. I wanted to do more touch points like that, which is why I was so heavily involved in all of the leagues that wound up uh, emerging, Galaxy Games, um, God, the place in Streamwood, yeah. Uh, Gala Bowl. Gala, yeah. Uh, there was about five or six. We had one where we introduced, uh, introduced, where we unveiled the first uh, Revenge from Mars that was near where I lived in Arlington Heights at Just for Fun. Uh, so I wanted to do more of that. And obviously, for people who know me, uh, the core person that I saw heading all of that up was going to be Steve Epstein. Oh, yeah. Come on board to work with Gary on a basis of trying to work with local operators. And they never really, of what Steve was trying to do with the TOPS system to support it when it was introduced. I saw Steve's role to be comparable to what he and I did by hand individually to help give birth to Papa. Mm hmm. Um, well, maybe we should take a minute then to uh, ask about the distribution then. Uh, you, you would be acquiring a company with its distribution deals, with uh, the coin-op-centric, uh, operator-centric distributors. Um, and one of the most notorious things uh, in the competitive viewpoint is that if they distributed the WMS product, they could not also distribute Sega Pinball slash Stern Pinball. Uh, right. So you would have continued that. You would have had the same distributors with that same kind of an exclusivity deal. Absolutely. And did you have any concerns about those distributors not wanting you to do direct interface with the operators or even the locations? <laughs> of course it came down on me hard when I first started with the company and uh, helped create not only a uh, a distributor uh, uh, group uh, words fail me from time to time but uh, uh, key distributors who would come in and we would talk to them uh, I did the same for operators uh, they were concerned that a lot of the outreach that I was doing through uh, some of my uh, media uh, was uh, detracting from them, losing control, that we were suddenly somehow going to be selling direct, something that uh, Allied Leisure had done that destroyed them after they went direct, Arnold Cam and Kyle thought that uh, he could do so after the success of track and field. And he wound up cutting off all of his distributors. No, I valued the distributors. I knew that they were gonna be integral. Uh, but I also knew that there needed to be ways to reach operators. And one of the things that I wound up doing was 
uh, I opened up the door for the entire industry, not just Williams at the time, to participate at the nightclub and bar show. Uh, oh, right. Bowl Expo, which is taking place now in the beginning of the week. Pizza show. Uh, there are about eight to ten different allied industries that had uh, trade shows that the industry itself, coin op industry, never took advantage of. And I felt that these are places that have games. Uh, if you guys don't want to do it, Williams is going to do it. If I could get, uh, you know, Joe and Marty at the time, and Steve and, and Neil and Kenny to agree to the investment, but instead it wound up becoming an AMOA or AAMA uh, event. Yeah, so the Manufacturers the, Association would kind of agree among they would themselves have the booth, to represent the whole and industry. And if it was, um, God, if it was Konami as the video game company uh, for, for one show, then it was Atari for the next. If it was Williams for one show, Yes, it was Bally for the next because we would separate out. But then it could be Stern. It could be Premier. You know, whatever it would be, it would be rotating, working, God, back then with Bob Fay. Yeah. Working with the folks just to expose us. You know, to have somebody there present to a answer questions. And I remember one nightclub and bar, just as an example, and bear with me. And if this is boring to people, then just stop me at any time. But... I think the audience is really absorbing all this great historical information. Okay, good. Thank you. I know how long-winded I am. My sons have pointed it out to me, so I tend to flinch a little bit. But uh, it was a nightclub and bar show. Uh, there was uh, a fellow there who had uh, asked me a question. I, I, I actually flew out for that one and was manning the booth along with a couple other people. And he had asked specifically about a jukebox and whether or not he could buy the jukebox directly. And it was like, I don't know. Here, go talk to whoever it would have been. Go talk to Joe over there. I don't know what his policy might be. Because again, these are people, and I'll share the story, which was emblematic. So some fellow comes over. He has a location, God only knows where. We had Hurricane on, uh, on display, so it gives you the time frame as to where we were at. And uh, I was standing by the game and uh, he came over and he saw my badge and it was like, yes, AMO or whatever it was, Ann Williams. And he was like, oh, I have your new game that we just got in. We got the Cyclone, which is just fantastic. We love it. And I tried to break the news to him that that was not the new game. That was the game from 1987. Hurricane is actually the the, the new game. Uh, oh, so how, how do I get this? How, and we had a long conversation in terms of the operator that he was working with and the fact that the operator was making all the decisions and whatever else. And I think that, you know, all I said was, you know, if there is a way to work with him, uh, it's on his, it's his best interest to provide you with the best possible games so that the revenue being generated is a good one. And I immediately went into a totally different direction, which probably is one of my defining points in my career. So explain to me what kind of location you have. And I don't remember the specifics, but my thing admittedly was, so let me ask you a question. Uh, what are you doing promotionally? You running any tournaments? Are you doing any leagues? You know, forgetting about darts or anything else that you may or may not. Have. What are you doing to promote your business? If if Tuesday nights are slow, are are you putting your games on half price? Uh, are are you offering uh, a free slice of pizza if somebody gets a certain score? What are you doing to help build up your coin operated coins going in and build up more player loyalty? So immediately, I'm not looking at trying to sell direct to the location. I'm not looking at wanting to disrupt the relationship between the operator and uh, the location owner. What I am attempting to do is to get that location owner to understand 
that he's in the retail business. I don't care what it is. It can be a bar, a bowling alley, whatever, a game room. It's a retail business. You're opening up your door and people are coming in to buy what it is that you have on display, whatever it is that you are selling. So that was my approach when it came to dealing with distributors who thought I was trying to do something that was going to be disruptive. And I think to further put an exclamation point on it, because my role with the IFPA, which came about because operators in Wisconsin, and primarily Wisconsin, but also in the Midwest, wanted to hold on to their locations. Uh, they had dart leagues and everything else. They knew what Steve Epstein and I had already created with Papa, which was starting to grow and really take hold. Uh, and uh, decided to start the, uh, it was the International Pinball Association. And I said, nope, it can't be because internationally, in some places, uh, Flipper is the defining part. So it became the IFPA. Uh, each of the companies put in $20,000. Uh, we put in 40, obviously, for Williams and Bally to help fund it. And leagues started, which grew into uh, the very first uh, tournaments for the IFPA. First one held at uh, O'Hare Airport at the Hilton. Uh, the second one up in uh, Milwaukee uh, at the airport. So again, that was the premise of how I wanted to hopefully approach uh, operators and location owners and distributors to work more in concert and to uh, develop an audience. So I, again, if that totally answers the question or went off the rails, Dave, if you can tell uh, me. It answers a good portion of it. I think also uh, we discovered during the aughts, and I at least had a hint in 1998, 99, but during the aughts, it became pretty clear that even the players uh, brought together through online forums could be a resource to be harnessed so that uh, you could have the players take the lead you know if if that location you talked to at the nightclub and bar expo uh, told you that they had a slow Tuesday night but had no idea about leagues there would be some way to post something out on rec.games.pinball to say Here's a location that needs help with the league for Tuesday nights. Can the players in this city uh, go make a little committee to do something there? That so let me, uh, let me jump in for a minute. Sure. As uh, what you've just said is uh, really important. So my son, Josh, who people may know, uh, he was at the University of Illinois as a freshman and had already been around with Steve and myself and Papa Leagues and along with his brother, Zach, and, and, and so on, uh, wanted to start a pinball league. And we went to, uh, he went to the University of Illinois. We went to some of the uh, main on-campus bars. I think it was like the Illini Inn or something was one. They had about four games. I remember going in with Josh to ask the manager, the owner, uh, if he uh, would be okay uh, if they ran a pinball league. Um, you tell us whatever night is a slow night. No, 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 we don't want, well, no, 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 they'll run it. Just wondering. They're going to come in, they're going to drink beer, they're going to buy food, uh, they're going to come in for some period of time. Think of a bowling league. It's going to be something similar. Uh, well, no, we just don't want the games to be tied up and we don't want this. And we don't. And it's like, wow, really? Okay. And we went to about four other places. And then finally we went to the student union and the fellow who had uh, the, uh, the operations at, there was a game room outside of the food court. And then there was like a lineup of about four or five games in absolutely horrendous uh, state of, of, uh, of, <laughs> operation in the bowling alley and asked him if he would mind now again this is at a bowling alley 
they're doing some leagues and I, would he mind uh, if uh, they were to do a pinball league? And he said, no. And I said, you know, and they'll fix the games. You know, if you give them access to the keys or whatever else. And, and Josh can, I, I think maybe has talked about it. Uh, Brian Woodard, who I guess is still the commissioner of IFPA after all of these many years, uh, runs the league. The league has been ongoing for what, the past 20 years since Josh has been away and out of school. Um, the earnings went from, I don't know, maybe if he was lucky, he was getting about five or $10 per machine. Uh, it became a test location, started bringing in close to $300 per week per machine. Uh, there was, you know, a league that was ongoing with, with trophies and, and all the rest of it. And it was just a question of showing somebody, you know, look, early on, everything that was done at the Broadway arcade, it was easy because Steve was there. And I was there. We needed to make sure that we could do a test. A fellow by the name of Ron Colucci had a, uh, a game room in Willowbrook, uh, New Jersey. I want to say it was Willowbrook. Um, yeah, New Jersey people are nodding that they yeah. know the place. Uh, he had bought a new place. It was a converted church. He had opened up uh, and there was a mall over there or whatever else, and then Pinebrook, I guess it was Pinebrook, New Jersey, he had opened up his, his game room in the church uh, with pinball machines in this big room, video games and whatever else. And uh, I knew Ronnie, and uh, I, I went in, and along with Steve, Steve's living in New Jersey, I'm still living, I think I'm either in New York, or I'm actually now in Connecticut, uh, and asked Ron if we could start a pinball league. Huh? No, 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 no. Steve and I will run it. Uh, we'd like to do it Sunday mornings because that's a slow time for you. And I remember moving all of his pinball machines. They, they were all facing uh, perpendicularly, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. So on either wall, right and left, when you walked in, and all you could see was kind of like the sides. I opened them all up. I fanned them out so you could kind of see what they looked like when he was in the back doing whatever and he came out, what did you do? He said, oh, wow, that looks really nice. I said, well, we want people to be able to see the games. It's inviting them in. And uh, he broke down. Uh, Steve would travel up from Watcham, New Jersey, Sunday mornings. We put a sign up uh, for people. I think we had like six or eight to start with just to see. And it was twofold. One, would they understand my scoring system? And... <laughs> 10, 5, 3, and 1. Would well, they understand that? Would well, they understand the whole premise of what we were doing? Uh, and uh, ultimately, we want to bring in bagels and, and bring in donuts on a Sunday. And Steve and I would schlep in every Sunday. I want to say about three or four weeks in, Ron actually showed up because earnings were up on the pinballs. He wanted to see what was going on in his location since he was making more money now. And uh, we wound up I think it was, there was a couple of people who were like really, really into it and asked if they could bring in more people and we were sure. And it was like, you know what? You guys have the scoring sheets. You know how to, do you want to try to run this? And we let them do, I think Steve and I bit our, our lips for like a couple of weeks where we decided not to go. We probably went and played golf or something, but um, where we finally went back to see everything posted because we were getting the results uh, somehow. I forget however it was done because computers back then were whatever. Uh, but I was posting standings and who was doing what or whatever. So we, we would get like the raw scores and then I would type everything out and, uh, and, and put up the sheets when I got there. And they took over the league and it was like, okay, Let's try it at the Broadway Arcade and see if one of the leagues, whether it's a mixed league or whatever else, if you can designate, in quotes, a captain who will take in the money or do whatever and whatever. And that's how it all started. So I, I think that the, the, the key, Dave, to your point, and, and not necessarily being totally immersed in uh, rec doc games or any of the other stuff, was to empower the players um, and, and doing it on the basis of uh, can they bring in their own games? 
Uh, I did it as a test. Jesus, I just thought of this. Even before college, I did it as a test outside of Buffalo Grove High School when Josh was in high school. There was a pizza place and went and talked to the guy and said, hi, are you willing to do any kind of promotions? He had a pinball machine, whatever it might have been. I think it was around the time I was able to get him a taxi. So again, it gives you a time frame. Um, yeah. But he had a game that wasn't really earning anything or whatever. You wound up becoming a test location for us. And I said, give away a free piece of pizza. Jesus, you know, set up a high score. Give away a soda. Do something. And I think he wound up uh, expanding the business through an operator. Uh, I put him in touch with an operator where there was three pinball machines in the location. So I, I think that, you know, I believe very strongly in empowering people. And look, IFPA has taken it to, you know, the next levels of what I would have done starting in 1999, 2000. There's country directors, there's regional and state directors. There's all of that. That was all part and parcel of what I dreamed of and what Steve uh, shared that dream of with me. All right. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty good uh, idea of how you would take the new company. Did you have a name for this uh, spinoff of Williams Pinball? No, I mean, I actually just thought of it as being Williams Electronics, but I'm sure that that would not have been possible. Yeah. So, I, I don't think that I have the same level of vanity to have it be sharp pinball, uh, but uh, would have come up with something that hopefully okay. would have made uh, some sense. Knowing so I, I want to ask one more thing about what this, the new company versus another model that kind of emerged. I would say what, what Jack Guarneri was doing in the aughts was more like he would sell direct to people who had lots of money, particularly rock stars, and kind of do a radiate out from the celebrities. You know, this celebrity has pinball games at home, and uh, this rich person has pinball games at home. And and you seem to be thinking more of like the uh, the grassroots and and staying with the coins going in the coin slot as opposed to uh, trying to increase uh, sales to the home. Uh, you didn't actually say what your percentage was, but it sounds like you would have stayed under 10% of sales to the home in your uh, plan. I think that that's probably accurate. Uh, yeah. Concern was twofold. Uh, and, and Jack's business is predicated on home sales to begin with. Uh, technical support. Yeah. Who's going to go out and fix a game? Uh, who's going to go out that I can trust to fix a game? Look, most of us, any of us probably have encountered, unless we are technically adapt ourselves, I am not, uh, nor have I ever been, although I have done my share of little minor things. Um, I've had situations where somebody has come to, in quotes, fix my game, and the game is not really fixed or it's fixed for some short period of time. And then I am left trying to see, well, is there somebody else that I can trust? You know, that network didn't exist. For somebody like Jack, it was easy. He had home sales. So whoever he was selling to, I needed to ensure that my distributors who had technicians that could deliver and set up a game in somebody's home could sign service contracts. Uh, I needed to be like an electronics store mm -hmm. through my network. Uh, so whether it was Apt Electronics or Best Buy or some others, if I'm getting some uh, appliance, uh, I need to stand behind it if I'm a Mana or Frigidaire uh, as much as I do if I am X pinball company to stand behind my product. And I think that that would have been something that, and to your point, Dave, maybe it would have evolved. But if I'm looking at 1999 and the amount of home sales that were happening back then, which were negligible for new equipment, just based on 
the price. Right. Used equipment, absolutely. And were there independent, small little dealers that were out there, uh, sub distributors selling? Yes. I know many of them that existed that I had worked with and dealt with over the years. So that's not to suggest that I would not have encouraged them, that I would not have worked with them in some way, shape or form. But I think that by and large, I would have needed, I would have needed the community to catch up. And by catching up, I would have been forced, and I'm using the word not necessarily as something that I would have been against, but I would have been forced to make the necessary adjustment and to acknowledge and recognize uh, that the world was changing. I needed to change with it as well. And potentially, I would have, if all my plans had come into play and borne fruit, I probably would have um, sped up the process of home purchase. Okay, that's that incredible technologies sped up the purchase of Golden Tea Golf for the home. Yeah, um, I think we have uh, some interest. Uh, the people have stayed longer than we advertised to hear oh, this. I'm sorry. So, uh, if you have a question that has still not been answered after this pretty comprehensive review of what that alternate scenario would be like. Please walk up to the question microphone there. And, and oh, okay, we'll do a, we'll do a wireless uh, walk around. If, raise your hand if, okay. Is it Brendan? Yes. Pinball designer himself. Uh, and and uh, I will interject before we get to his question that uh, Jim Patla is in Boston, so he will be here live. So we are going to have a guy from the Pinball 2000 project here live. And so questions about Pinball 2000 can also be directed to Jim at his seminar later this afternoon. So Brendan, what's your question for Roger? Uh, yeah, Roger, you mentioned uh, Barry Ausler a couple times that, you know, it was such a bummer to hear that he passed away earlier this year. Um, my question is if you could share some of your most fond memories with Barry and if you feel he would have been someone that you would have brought back to the design team had this uh, purchase of Williams gone through. Uh, let me answer the last question first. Absolutely. Uh, Barry, Barry was, uh, was wonderful, a unique individual. Uh, what I remember was feeling so bad for him because he had to put aside his project to work on Las Vegas, which became Barracora. Uh, but Barry, Barry had just a, a, a bright side to him. Uh, he was kind of like, and, and I'm going to say this, and I don't mean anything to, to, to be uh, offensive to anybody, uh, but he, he always seemed to be, and this is for me as an outsider before I began working full time at the company always seemed to be outside of the, the main group of folks that were hanging out. And I say that principally in terms of uh, Eugene and Larry and Steve with, with their mutual backgrounds from uh, Atari and Larry coming in as, as the new kid, uh, the shining star, and Barry being really on, on the old school side with Steve Kordak and uh, Dick Velasic and uh, some of the other folks back then. Um, but... Uh, he was just, he's just a sweet, sweet man with an incredible gift for understanding uh, geometry and layout of games. And obviously having the fortitude enough to be able to work with Python so often. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I miss him. And absolutely, I would have wanted him to be there because Barry was taking nothing away from any of the other guys, was always dependable. Um, yeah never was running late on projects again not casting any aspersions on anybody but uh he was he was fundamental to the core that's what we've always heard about barry uh other other questions went up here and roger would you have kept steve kordek oh god yes okay just Absolutely. just wanted to get that and, on the record yeah no no, no. and and uh, i would have actually put Steve into a totally different position of influence um, 
everybody used to go to Steve just to ask questions. I think everybody has been somewhat vocal about that, all the designers over the years and how influential he was. Uh, I would have actually set up regular meetings, whether mm -hmm. they would have been on site or off site uh, for Steve to kind of give primers and talk about things uh, on a general basis rather than just one on ones. That's not to disregard the one on ones. But uh, yeah, I, in fact, I would like to have had Steve do another game. Wow. And not just uh, the tic tac toe type of yeah. uh, whatever the game. The last game was that he did. Which was the uh, uh, the novelty redemption game? Yeah, you had a question. So, so Roger, you um, talked about the premier deal that didn't work. Um, yes. What year was that approximately? <sighs> Would have been a couple of years before. And the point that I will make, uh, and, and something that Dave mentioned about the distributors and what have you uh, for the Williams purchase. One of the, the big issues, and I, I believe Gil Pollock is still alive, so I don't want to say anything that's going to be untoward, but uh, the amount of uh, money that was being owed of the company by distributors uh, was uh, enormous, which made it not feasible. There was also a facility that they had developed or built, I want to say somewhere in the Dakotas or whatever, where they were starting to work on uh, some gaming product. Yeah, I think that was a. They had a cabling division up in the Dakotas, and thank you. Expanding okay. That. Yeah. Well, they were looking at trying to do some building of uh, slots and whatever, I believe. But uh, that was just a sinkhole financially. So the problem was that the numbers didn't add up because of the accounts receivable. Uh, we looked, and under the best case scenario, if memory serves. It was going to be five years before we could see profitability. And even then we weren't certain if we could get all of the vendors that still owed money, all of the distributors that still owed money to actually pay back on some reasonable percentage amount. Yeah, so you'd be starting out as a bad guy collecting back debts and... Yes. Yeah. I, the reason I went there is because I wondered if that deal did work out what would Valley Williams look like in two years? Oh, wow. Interesting question. Uh, truthfully, God, I would have gone full bore. Uh, and, you know, again, John Trudeau and others were still there. Tim Skelly was still there uh, at the time. And, and uh, slew Adolf, God. Adolf Seitz Jr. Um, I probably would have poached a lot of people from Williams <laughs> to come over. You know, it's comparable to what Capcom did with uh, Foots and Python, Mark Ritchie and the like. And the fact that uh, I came uh, about this close to actually going to work at Capcom when Mike Stroll was getting ready to uh, renew his uh, contract with him. But that's another story for another time that I've never really talked about. But uh, yeah, I mean, wow. I would have gone back in to absolutely use the Gottlieb name. Uh, Alvin and I had spoken when he started AG. Uh, I was supposed to go to work there. Uh, there's another story with that with Michael. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, I would have played off of the uh, incredible legacy and heritage of what D. Gottlieb meant to pinball. And uh, God, that would have been exciting as hell uh, to really bring something back up on its bootstraps. I saw the Williams opportunity as just continuing success, if you will. The Gottlieb opportunity I saw as something to really build on, having been instrumental in getting them Stargate and a couple of other licenses. Wow, this is much. so many more. Uh-oh, David Fix wants to ask a question. I'm getting the camera focused on him so you can see him. Go ahead with your question. Molly. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Quick Hi. question for you, Roger. All right, now you got my you you piqued my interest. So, did you even think about going after Capcom when they were closing the doors? Were you thinking about buying them? Because no, there was really nothing to buy. I met with uh, the three uh, Japanese principals. I mean, just very quickly, uh, I had agreed uh, in 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 essence to uh, 
going over there uh, as the uh, vice president of uh, marketing and licensing. Um, and Mike Stroll uh, was renewing his contract. And he said, let's just hold off until everything is locked in uh, before you actually make the move. And uh, things kind of hit a wall with Mike. Uh, he was not renewed. Uh, the Japanese still had uh, a desire for me to come and join them. And I'll just leave it at that, that uh, I did not join them despite what the offer was. But you didn't, you didn't go after trying to buy them when Capcom closed? No, I mean, truth, there, there was nothing really to buy at that point in time. I mean, not taking anything away from, I guess, what was it, Flipper Pinball or something that they had come up with? Flipper soccer. Football. Flipper Football, Big Bang Bar, um, yeah, King Big Pin. Bang Bar, yeah. Right, uh, Break Shot or Break Out, or whatever yep. it was. Um, now, I mean, I the people, yes. Uh, the equipment, the technology that they had, there was nothing that was relatively important to me. Mm. I couldn't have accessed and resourced all those parts otherwise. So I, I didn't view it as a real, in quotes, pinball company. I saw it as something that Capcom had kind of dipped its toe into. Um, I'll, I'll share with you, look, if Mike had come back and I had gone over there, I think eventually, uh, whether it had been called Stroll Pinball or whatever else, uh, <clears throat> I think that the two of us would have probably taken the company over. And at that point in time, yes, uh, there would have been an interest to take on uh, ownership as opposed to just being employees. Very interesting. All right, I think uh, we need to take our lunch hour Seminars resume. I am so sorry but for being so long. No, this 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 is going to be a great historical document. Well, thank you everybody for uh, indulging me, and as I said, hopefully if things work out uh, and I'm ever invited back, and the travel works, where pilots are actually now employed and flights actually get from point A to point B without going to C, D, and E. Um, <laughs> I'd love to uh, to be there in person with you all. So have a, have a wonderful uh, time. And again, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, putting up with me. <laughs> okay.